is uh, an organization set up to try to uh, fund, to give grants um, to promote research on cosmology, on the foundations of physics, um, and other questions about basically the fundamental nature of reality. Um, and most importantly, perhaps, Max is a fellow member of the Swedish International Mafia. Uh, <laughs> tentacles far and wide uh, in many institutions. Uh, so, uh, so he's become well known uh, for many, I mean, across the internet, you can read about like, people talking about the Tegmark 4, the Tegmark 3 um, level universe. Uh, and maybe uh, we will be talking more about that today. So, Max. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a great honor. and. Uh, and pleasure. Now that you've heard things about me, let me just uh, learn a little bit more about you first. So raise your, your hand if you're in some way affiliated with the Future of Humanity Institute. All right. Raise your hand if you're in some way affiliated with the physics department that owns this building. And raise your hand if you didn't raise your hand. If, so, who just, you just came here because you care about the future of humanity or, or thought this was interesting. Okay, wonderful. We have a nice broad uh, audience here. I want to talk about the future of life, which is of course a question that one can talk about from many perspectives. And I want to talk about it from my perspective, the cosmic perspective, my perspective as a working cosmologist, which makes it a little bit different. Most of the time when we stress out about the future, People worry about, oh, what's going to happen you know, next year, next election, next decade. For me, I'm very interested in the next giga year. What's going to happen in 10, billion, in 10 billion years? What's going to happen in the very distant future as well? And uh, this perspective, in many ways, makes the problems we face now seem even more urgent to me, because we have so much more to gain if we get our act together and so much more to lose if we blow it. So we're heading towards the future on this path I'm illustrating here. And we all wonder, you know, what lies around the bend? There are many scenarios that the Future of Humanity Institute <laughs> considers. Happy ones where we humans get our act together. Maybe life eventually spreads out into the solar system and, and beyond. And maybe less happy ones where things, in one way or the other, go really, really bad. And, before we get into that in, in more detail, let me tell you a bit more just about my perspective and how cosmology has, um, has really transformed our understanding of, of our human place in the world. When I first started doing my PhD in cosmology with Joe Silk, my, whom I'm, I'm very honored to have in the audience here, that's my PhD advisor here. <laughs> Thank you, Joe, so much for making me a cosmologist. Cosmology was still sort of just gradually coming, only coming in from the cold, from being, when Joe started working on, in, in this field, and you know, if you rewind when Joe was doing a lot of great stuff in the 1970s, this was a very flaky subject, somewhere out there between philosophy and metaphysics, where there was very little data. You could speculate with your friends about how old our universe was and where it came from over some beer, preferably, because there was no data. Uh, and that's all changed because since then, and in fact largely since I, I graduated with Joe, we've enjoyed this avalanche of high quality data. Of not just one kind, if you've read in recent news about the Planck satellite or whatever, but of many, many different kinds in what we call a smörgåsbord in Sweden, you know, a whole sampler of different delectable things. And, that's totally transformed this from being this flaky field which Joe initially went into, into being really precision science, where we've gone from arguing back then whether our universe is 10 billion years old or 20 billion years old to arguing about whether it's 13.7 billion years old or 13.8 billion years old. And I'll actually tell you a little bit about the new Planck data, which is sort of settled that actually it's probably 13.8. And we can start arguing about the next decimal place. So what have we learned from all this data? What have we learned so far about our place in space? Let us uh, just very, very briefly zoom out a little bit from Oxford uh, and uh, take a little spin around. So if we head out, if we head out uh, away from Earth, 
the ancient Greeks, of course, Eratosthenes figured out very cleverly how big this ball is that we're living on. And people were really impressed by its size. And then through a lot further cleverness, they were able to figure out how big the moon was, how far away it is, and that the solar system is just vastly larger than this. Now we humans have gradually, with aid of technology, you know, managed to get a little bit off this planet. We've only gone to the moon, but we've, we've of course managed to place a lot of useful technology in orbits. In a moment here, you'll see um, all the artificial satellites that are currently orbiting our planet. And uh, this is all ex exactly to scale. This is a nice animation put together by the American Museum of Natural History in, in New York. And, and then um, already getting to the moon, of course, sort of changed, gave us humans a little bit of well-needed humility when we looked at our planet as a whole. But we now realize, of course, that this too is just very small compared to what else is out there. When uh, my grandma first went to college, one still didn't know how far, we didn't know what stars were. They didn't even know why the sun was shining. That was only sorted out in the 30s. And now, when we look at stars at night from Oxford, if the weather is good, we see things which are typically so far away that it's taken hundreds of years for light to reach us from there, right? We're seeing things, if someone is over there looking at Oxford, they wouldn't see us here. They wouldn't see England, but they might see Henry IV doing his stuff or whatever. It's that sort of distance scale. As, and as we, as we zoom out farther, the galaxy that we live in, whose existence wasn't even really settled until 1925, and it's 100,000 light years from side to side. And it's only coming into view now as we zoom out a lot farther. And one of the things I've worked on a lot in my career is making three-dimensional maps of where all these galaxies are, not just our own, but tens of thousands and thousands and with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey project we've mapped out the million or so most interesting ones in 3D. So you can see here accurately these patterns that they form and by studying them in great detail that's one of the tools we've used to, to answer that question about how old our universe is for instance. So every little dot here now is a galaxy which, in, which contains hundreds of billions of stars and planets. And beyond all that we see a bizarre pattern of yellow and green and blue here, which the pundits in the audience recognize as the cosmic microwave background. So, so far, everything else seemed kind of reasonable. We zoomed out, there were more stars, more galaxies, but what is this weird sphere doing here behind everything? That deserves a bit more explanation. To understand that, it's not enough to just talk about our place in space. We actually have to talk about our place in time as well. If we want to know what happened long ago, it's not so easy necessarily. But if we want to know what happened in our universe long ago, it's fortunately extremely easy. We just look far away into the sky and see light that's been traveling to us ever since that time. So the sky is, of course, a time machine. In, in that sense. This is uh, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Raise your hand if, you're, uh, if you like taking pictures, if you would consider yourself a bit of a photo buff. So th this is one of the most hardcore photos ever taken in, in the sort of geeky sense, because this wasn't the one second exposure, which is about the longest I've taken. It's a three month exposure. And this isn't some sort of large aperture lens that you could put on your camera. It's a two and a half meter lens. And this was taken from space to get away from Earth's atmosphere by the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's such an awesome telephoto that this is zooming in on a region which would cover the head of a pin only at arm's length. Okay? So this is a pretty amazing photo. And by looking at this, you can see things which actually happened 12 billion years ago, say. But you can also see things much closer by. And by looking at things at very different distances, we cosmologists have been able to piece together a pretty good understanding of what happened in different epochs of our universe. And as, as most of you are already familiar, what really happened exactly 13.8 billion years ago, we honestly don't know. 
we will have a lot of fun discussion about this at another at, at two workshops that are taking place here in Oxford right now. One about inflation, which is the best theory game in town for what happened very early on here, and also in the other one about quantum cosmology. However, that ignorance about how things really began should not overshadow the fact that we, ha we know a, a great deal about what happened in the 13.8 billion years since then, because we can actually see most of that, as I mentioned, by just looking at different distances away. We know that everything that we can now see was once squished together and so dense and so hot that it was hotter than the core of the sun. It was mostly hydrogen back then, and we know what hot hydrogen does in the core of the sun. It does fusion, so it, must have done, it should have done the same exact thing back in our early universe. And you can calculate that that fusion would have produced helium until it got so cold that the fusion reactor switched off. You can figure out that it would have produced about 25% helium. Then you can go out and measure how much helium is there in the universe in these pristine regions. Well, 25%. So we have the awesome fossil evidence. We can do more detailed calculations about this fusion stuff and figure out how much lithium and deuterium and helium-3 there should be quite good agreement. And then when we get, go a little farther forward in time now, to about 400,000 years after the unknown, it's cool enough that the hydrogen is more like the surface of the sun. And this plasma, which was opaque back then, becomes transparent, giving off this cosmic microwave background radiation that, I'll come back, that I just mentioned. And then from then on, we can literally see where the ordinary telescopes first galaxies forming and later bigger galaxies forming all the way through until today. What do we mean when we talk about our universe? We're going to be discussing a lot the future of life in our universe, so I owe you an explanation of this. When we say our universe, we mean basically the region of space from which life has had time to reach us so far during the 13.8 billion years since our Big Bang, you know, the part of space that we can be quite sure exists that we can't see. And because when I look really, really far away, as I mentioned, I'm looking farther and farther back in time, the hydrogen is hotter and hotter, because I eventually get to this epoch when the whole thing was a plasma, which is opaque, it looks to me like I'm staring into an opaque wall sitting there behind all the galaxies. That's what this image at the bottom is indicating. But of course, I could look in that direction. I'll have the exact same impression. Transparent hydrogen, transparent hydrogen, opaque plasma. And so it looks to us actually like we're surrounded on all sides by, by, by an opaque wall of hydrogen plasma. This is the cosmic microwave background. These beautiful pictures are simply photos of this plasma. They're baby pictures of our universe the way it was 400,000 years after our Big Bang. And uh, these are photos you can't take with a regular camera. The light comes to us in the form of microwaves, but they're photos nonetheless, and conceptually very easy to understand. WMAP, the Wilkinson satellite, produced these gorgeous images. Here I have worked with, some, with um, Angelica Dolivera Costa and Andrew Hamilton to clean out galactic radio noise in the foreground so you can get a cleaner image like this. And this is the picture that to me became, was the iconic image of our universe. Our universe is this sphere, everything within it. Until a couple months ago, when we got this. I took the recent Planck data and projected it the way I like to think about it as a sphere again here, just so you can compare the two. And you can see two things. You can see that, first of all, Cosmology used to be considered so speculative back when Joe still nonetheless had the courage to go into it because you would have all these different people measuring things that would disagree with each other. Some guy would say, oh, I've measured the expansion rate of the universe and it's this much. And someone else would say, oh, I measured it and it's twice as much. And then they would argue about that for 10 years in a hopeless gridlock. Well, here you have one team that made this beautiful measurement and another team, and look, they agree incredibly well and all the large-scale patterns. So this is no longer mostly noise. This is a really sig mostly signal. What you also see is that it was worth the wait. This new satellite has even sharper resolution. It has about four times better resolution. This isn't three megapixels anymore. Now we're talking 50 megapixels. 
and there's a gold mine of cosmological information encoded in that. Just to give you a little bit of a, of a flavor for how exciting this development has been, with apologies, I'll go a little bit technical in just in the next five minutes and talk a little bit about the Planck satellite stuff, but I promise to pretty quickly get back on track and talk about the future of, of life more generally, okay? So if for some reason I throw you off with, with some Cosmo geeky nerdy stuff for the next five minutes, don't worry. It's not going to impact the rest. So, so to really appreciate how cool this is, I have to go back to 1995. <laughs> <laughs> Not, the universe was younger, so was I. This is what I looked like. This was the year the Macarena was popular. That's how long ago it was. And this is, this is what cool computer graphics was considered to be in 1995 when the satellite was first proposed. It was called Cobra Samba back then before it got renamed. And the best maps we had then, the best baby pictures we had then of our universe came from the satellite called Kobe which later got the Nobel Prize for it. And look what an incredibly low resolution they had. So then the race was on. A lot of experiments from the South Pole, from high altitude balloons, etc., cetera, race to try to gradually make sh sharper images, first of small parts of this map in various places. And I had a lot of fun in many cases working with the experimentalist who took this data and they would give me some huge file in vaults. And then I would work with them to figure out what how to make maps of this and what it actually meant. In, uh, the, in, uh, th in 1995, I came to Oxford for the very first time. So I always feel a tinge of awesome nostalgia when I return here because George of Staffew, a cosmologist who, who worked here at the time, invited me for the first time ever to go do, as a, to visit somewhere as a, as a cosmologist and give a, and come do research with him, which was a huge honor. And we worked together on preparing the science case for this satellite, the Planck satellite, and where we were think, we did a lot of work on how do you clean out all the galactic radio noise that we call foregrounds, and how well can you actually do things. Eventually, it got funded, and. In 1996, we were very excited, got renamed to Planck. And uh, another satellite, WMAP, also got funded. And as you can see here, WMAP was actually quite anomalous. Usually, space experiments get delayed by 10 or 20 years, and then they finally happen. But WMAP went from funding to launch in five years, and they released the data in another two years. It's absolutely amazing. And I don't, I'm not showing this to make Planck look bad. I think actually, WMAP was the exception. I think it was arguably NASA's best science return per dollar invested ever. Those guys worked so incredibly hard. And uh, the PI even collapsed after they released the data because they hadn't slept for so long and had to be hospitalized. It, it, it was a really amazing effort. Uh, but Planck was also worth the wait. In, in, in 2009, it launched. And we just had the first data released now. Uh, they're going to run out of the, of the liquid helium that keeps the thermometers in there cold soon. And, or actually, actually the, the, below, the high frequency instrument has already stopped working, but with the, the other part of it, the lower frequency is still taking some data. And there's a lot more data that's coming, on, coming in the pipe. We have, this is what the satellite itself looks like. Here is a little launch photo. And they took pictures of our, of our sky, shown here in the sort of flattened all sky, in the sort of flattened way that you show a, an Earth map of the entire globe in a single plane at many different frequencies, so many different colors of light. And that's very important because you can see there's also all this junk, radio noise from our galaxy. And that looks very different at different frequencies. So by combining maps at different frequencies, very, very carefully, you can make, you can reconstruct and see exactly what of what you're seeing is due to different kinds of, of galactic junk, which is actually something which is also interesting astrophysics signals for other people. And then you can subtract it off and make these really nice maps of what the baby universe, our baby universe looks like, okay? Which is exactly what I've projected for you here in these images. And then what do we do with this? These aren't just pretty pictures that one can show one's grandma and so on, but they're also chalk-loaded with, with 
all this interesting information about all these numbers that we cosmologists love to measure. So raise your hand if you know what a Fourier transform is. For those, a lot of wolves and sheep's clothes here, good. For those of you who know that, basically you do a Fourier transform of, of the sky or a spherical harmonic expansion, which is the sphere equivalent. For those of you who don't know what that is, worry not at all. Basically, imagine that you just look at all these spots and you kind of count up how many big ones are there, how many small ones are there, and you sort of make a histogram and you see, you try to look at how clumpy this, these pictures are on different scales. This is how junky the data looked in 96 when I made a little compilation of it. That's one year after I came to Oxford for the first time. And then I'm, I just pulled out of my hard drive here the state of the art compilations that I showed in talks every two years. After that, so that's 98, sorry, 2000, it's getting a little better, pretty awful still, 2002, 2004, it's cleaning up a little bit, 2006, the best data is already so awesome that you can, can't see the error bars anymore. And I put all these other curves on here because when I first started grad school with, with Joe, each one of the other curves here, they were predictions by other theorists whom I respected at the time. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you, see, you can see how much the data improved. 2008, and here we go now, the latest from, from Planck, where you can count one, two, three, four, five, maybe six or seven bumps if you squint hard. And if, if you put, plot this on a log scale together with the other data, it's just really a treasure trove of, of information. This curve is complicated because it depends on pretty much everything we care about in cosmology. Depends on how much dark matter there is, how much atoms there are, how much neutrinos weigh. It depends on how much dark energy there is. It depends on the details of the of inflation or the clumpiness in the early universe, etc. And it depends on most of those things in different ways. That's why it's so complicated. And that's also awesome, because that means if you can measure this curve really well, you can back out what most of these numbers are to pretty good accuracy. So the, the Planck team publishes tables with loads of numbers like this, with error bars, never mind what all the Greek letters are. The take home message is that so many of these things that we really care about, like how much dark matter is there, how curved is space, etc., we can now measure to good accuracy, sometimes percent level accuracy. So cosmology has definitely transitioned from being you know, flaky and speculative to being a precision science, which is something I could not have said without drawing a lot of laughter, you know, back when I was first working with Joe. The, the Planck satellite, what was really amazing with these results, the really sensational thing was that there was no sensation. There were so many sensational things that it could have found that people sort of hoped for that go by various nerdy names like I showed here, non-Gaussianity, B modes, curvature, topological defect evidence, et cetera, et cetera. None of that was found. Just the simplest model still fits all the data absolutely beautiful. Um, so uh, cosmology is sort of come of age in the sense that it's becoming, you have this very robust understanding of what's going on and, it, and things sort of fit. I'm going to skip over some of the cool things that Planck did because I want to leave time to come back to the main theme of the talk here. So what does this mean for us humans here on this planet as we look ahead? Well, first of all, the future of life is, of course, some level limited by the future of our universe. So what can we say about that? Back when I was in grad school, the story that I was told was, well, basically, there are two possibilities. Either things expand forever, and we end up with a big chill, where, where things just get more and more dilute and boring, or somehow gravity reverses its expansion and everything comes crashing back on itself again in a big crunch, kind of a big bang in reverse, creating effectively a giant black hole and putting an end to things. Now we actually have five options for the future. The big chill, the big crunch, the big rip, the big snap, and death bubbles, all of which are talked about in various degrees of seriousness by various people I know. I mentioned the big chill and the big crunch, or 
already. We used to think that to tell the difference between those two, you just needed to know how much stuff there was. Because the more stuff you had, the more gravity and the better the chance of gravity winning and pulling things together. Then dark energy came on the scene, this other weird substance which actually is pushing things apart. So there was a front page article in, the New York, in, the, in Time magazine saying, now we know how our universe is going to end. It's going to be the big chill. But they forgot to mention that we have no clue what dark energy is. And of course, until you know what it is, you can't really predict with certainty what it's going to do in the future. So Robert Caldwell, for example, pointed out that if, it, if the dark energy is sort of nasty, it could actually kind of anti-dilute and eventually tear everything apart in a big rip, where in a finite amount of time even the atoms get ripped apart. Uh, then another possibility, this is something uh, I've worried about, I want to call it our big snap. We take for granted that space, that, that uh, there is such a thing as a true continuum, that space, for example, is infinitely stretchy and that you can take space and not just stretch it a thousand fold, which is what we've seen with our telescopes happening, but stretch it an infinite number of times without anything bad happening. If for some reason you can't, there's another doomsday scenario or cosmocalypse for you. And, and um, there are also quantum mechanical reasons actually why you might worry that something like this could happen, which we can, we're going to talk about a little bit. I'll talk about it a little bit actually in my quantum talk here at the conference. Then there are death bubbles. We've learned that water can come in three phases. It can be liquid, solid, or gaseous, right? And uh, if you cool this down so that it's below zero Celsius, but you don't touch it at all, it'll be super cooled. It'll still be liquid, but it's very unstable. As soon as you tap it a little bit, poof, it all freezes instantly. And uh, peop some people have worried that then string theorists came along and said, hey, maybe our space is like that too. Maybe our space actually has three phases or maybe 10 to the 500 phases. Maybe there are many different solutions to the string theory or whatever the fundamental solutions are. And this is just one of them. So maybe our space can actually freeze. And um, so this is a scenario that some theoretical physicists do lose some sleep over. And, and the idea would be that if you do something sufficiently violent to space, you could trigger a bubble of this new frozen space or whatever you call it, and it would expand out with the speed of light, wiping out everything in its path. Actually, Nick Bostrom and I wrote an article in Nature a while back arguing that uh, we probably wouldn't have to worry too much about this happening within the next billion years or so, but, but <laughs> still can go on the list for, for doomsday scenarios if we're taking the long view, okay? I wouldn't, what do I lie awake worrying about at night? Actually, I know my main worrying is not about any of these five things because there are a lot of other things that are bad that could happen much sooner. So I've tried to summarize existential risks this is a very nice phrase that I think you, Nick, coined, right? Uh, <laughs> risks, of, you know, things that are just not just a little bit bad, like a parking ticket, really bad, that could wipe out or, or permanently mess up our human civilization. And I put them here in this figure I made on, on a scale where I just organized them by how far into the future they would happen. And you see, there's a huge range. The, the five cosmocalypse scenarios that I, I mentioned here are all, you know, talking 10 billion years from now, 100 billion years from now. There are a lot of other bad things which we know are going to happen much sooner. Sun is going to swallow up Earth. In fact, already in 1 billion years, the sun will be so hot that it'll boil off the oceans. Um, we'll collide with Andromeda in 3.5 billion years. There'll be a nearby gamma ray burst causing various problems. But my, my feeling is actually if we can get past these more urgent risks first and get by getting Iraq together, the ones on the left side, we can cope with these with the technology we'll have at the time. In fact, there's a, or there's a beautiful idea for how you can solve the whole sun swallows earth problem by deflecting asteroids from the outer solar system. You just have them fly close enough to earth that every time they go by they give us a little bit of a tug outward and you just move Earth to a larger distance from the sun where it's nice and cozy. And uh, it takes about a billion years to do it, but that's plenty of time as long as you start you know, within a couple, hundred, a couple of hundred million years from now. So I think we, what we really should do is 
just focus a lot on the more urgent things, and, and uh, then we can deal with that later. What are the most urgent things? Well, I put a lot of stuff on the list. I could, I'm not going to spend all day talking about it. If you want to know more about them, the Future of Humanity Institute is the place, the place to go. They have some beautiful reviews also summarizing these things. I'll just say a little bit about the single one on this list that I worry about the most, which is this one. Unfriendly artificial intelligence. So this is an old idea going back to Irwin Good, even long before I was born, who just pointed out that if you can ever build a machine with superhuman intelligence that's better at us at doing any intellectual task, then it follows that since building better computers is an intellectual task too, it, it's also better than us at that. So it can design, the first thing it can do is design a much better computer. It doesn't even have to go back and solder anything like that or microfab chips. It can start by just rewriting its entire software, which is probably very much crippling what it can do. You all know how lousy the software is that we run and it crashes all the time. You know, clearly it can be done better. And then, and then that new improved computer could very quickly improve itself. And in very short order, you would have something which is not just a little smarter than us, but just vastly smarter than us. And after that, it's very hard to predict what will happen. Different people come to very different conclusions about this. Some people, like Ray Kurzweil, feel, oh, this is awesome. It'll be wonderful. Maybe humans will somehow merge with this technology and life will be peace, love, and motherhood, and it'll be great. Uh, then there are other people who think this will be the worst thing that ever happened, it, that it might destroy humanity and also everything we care about in the process. Um, everybody has their opinion. Um, one thing I think is clear is that we, ought, we really don't know. And there's certainly, so we can't dismiss the possibility that it will be the most important change, either for the better or for the worse, to ever have happened to us. And my feeling is if we really don't know, probably a good idea to pen, put at least a little bit of thought into thinking, you know, thinking about it. And, and seeing what, if anything, can we or should we, should we do about it. And I feel, with a few awesome exceptions like you guys at the Future Humanities Institute, there's way too little attention given to this. I just finished a book, which is coming out in January, called Our Mathematical Universe. And even though it's a science book, mainly talking about my, my crazy physics ideas, I couldn't resist just having a whole chapter at the end exactly about this because I just feel I'm not just a scientist, I'm actually also a father. <laughs> I actually care about the future and I put in a little plug for, for things like this. And one of the things I talked about there was if there is a singularity of some sort, some ultra intelligent that happens, what's going to take place will depend critically on who's in control of this at first. And, and there are many different possibilities for who, who, who would control it, right? It could be open source, somehow developed by, at some universities that post it online, or it could be created by some egoistic human or some altruistic human, or maybe it's created by Google or Apple or some other corporation, or it could be created by the government. Um, not that the US government has any interest in uh, computers or reading your emails or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, NSA. Um, now, I th whatever uh, th these arrows are supposed to indicate here that I think most of these control scenarios are actually very unstable. And we'll quickly transition to another control scenario. I think if it's open source or whatever, very quickly someone will be best at exploiting this and sort of take power. If it's an egoistic human, or a for-profit corporation, they will pretty quick, within, before too long, kind of de facto become the government because they will be the richest player on the planet and can control everything. Uh, if it's an altruistic human, they could sort of also take over. Then it's also possible that, that uh, either some altruistic human or government decides to create, to actually give power to some sort of AI that they believe has their best interest in minds because they think that's safer. 
And then there might be some bugs or something unforeseen, and there might be an unfriendly AI that takes over. Uh, there is a group in Berkeley, the MIRI, Machine Intelligence Research Institute, that's looked, doing a lot of very active research to see whether it's actually possible to design machines who will sort of keep whatever friendly goals they initially had as they get smarter. It's very unclear whether it's possible or not, but it's certainly noble to try to find out. So that's uh, the singularity. Uh, if there is a singularity, then if, if it's possible to make superhuman intelligence, people also, then people also disagree violently about when it would happen or if. Some people say, oh, maybe in 1,000 years or 100 years. Then Ray Kurzweil thinks it'll be by 2029. We really don't know. Uh, it would probably be a good idea to think about it sooner rather than later, though. Uh, I would want to just put on the table that if this is actually a possibility that it might happen, there are two things we actually should really watch out for. We should both worry a lot, a lot about artificial intelligence being friendly and not just having as a goal to, um, oh. <laughs> whatever. But we should also worry about whether they're actually going to be conscious or not. If, because there's a lot of debate in the neuroscience community about what consciousness is and what causes it, etc. You could imagine making a machine which acts perfectly conscious but is actually not, where there's nobody in there that doesn't actually feel self-aware in any way. Or you could imagine that the, if the machine does feel conscious, maybe not quite the way we do, but at least feels that they're perceiving the world somehow. I think it's fair to say we also don't understand consciousness as well enough at this stage to be able to say whether any, any AI, would, whether there's anyone home there or not. My worst nightmare of all would be that it's a scenario where we feel that, oh, we have these, these Okay. this artificial intelligence among us now and they're like our children and love and peace and motherhood and this is awesome and they're continuing our family values and great and, and they even play soccer or football or whatever. But then with, without us realizing, they're not actually conscious. So then we, we, we have this future universe that nobody is aware of. I think that would be just pathetic and awful. You know, I don't think that I don't think that our universe gives meaning to us. I think it's us, self-aware entities, which give meaning to our universe. These galaxies that we looked at earlier, they're beautiful because you're looking at them. If, the, if nobody was aware of their existence, if nobody looked at them, they wouldn't be beautiful. They would just be a giant waste of space, as far as I'm concerned. So I would say if there's going to be some kind of friendly AI and you're not going to try to stop it, Make sure it's not just friendly, but it's actually conscious, too. Now, I am a professor, and that means I just can't help giving out grades. It's just a, one of those professorial habits. So I wanted to give a grade to humanity, very modestly, for our performance here in Risk Management 101. How well I feel we've dealt with these risks so far. I. I think there are two perspectives you can take on how we've done. If, if you look at, if you look at the things from the standard perspective, you can say we humans, some people think we're the pinnacle of evolution. If you look from the cosmic perspective, you, you ain't seen nothing yet. You know? If you have billions of years into the future, there's no reason to think that we here, don't take this as a personal insult in any way, you know, are the most advanced ways you can put quarks together. I could ima certainly imagine even more advanced life. Space, you know, we're obsessed about space here, uh, obsessed about our planet, but there's 10 to the 57 times more space, at least, you know, in our, in our universe. In terms of time, you know, we're so obsessed about the next 50 years, or in the US, usually they're obsessed about the next four, the politicians, and, but there are billions of years available. So there's all these opportunities. So my midterm grade, you know, a lot of people say, well, we're kind of muddling by, Max, you should give him a B minus. I'm giving a D minus, because I think we, we really suck in, in, in what we've done so far. We have an extinction probability per decade as a species, which we really don't know well. Maybe it's 
10 to the minus 2, maybe it's 10 to the minus 3, maybe it's 10 to the minus 4 on the low side, maybe it's 10 to the minus 1, we really don't know. But do we really want to be rolling the dice like this and have a significant chance of wiping us out, ourselves out each decade and then keep doing that for a billion years? It basically guarantees that the whole future is wasted, right? It's pathetic. D minus, I say. And just to emphasize this a little bit, I just pulled out the, an article that came by recently here about an asteroid that was going to fly past Earth. It's a no big deal. If it crashed into us, it would give a 100 megaton explosion, about twice the, what the Tsar Bomba did, the biggest hydrogen bomb ever detonated. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about this article, to me, was not the facts. It was this little thing that I highlight here in yellow. It said, oops, this was only discovered Sunday. <laughs> and this is written here, <laughs> this is written here just a few days later. <laughs> so what this means is this kind of thing, you could get a 50 megaton, you could get a 100 megaton detonation in London, you know, but basically no advance notice. It could happen tonight. That's how little effort we've put in the, the, in mitigating this particular existential risk, which is not a very hard one to mitigate. Put in a network of small robotic telescopes around the Earth connected to the internet. There are a lot of good scientific proposals um, which are simply not funded at the level I would like to fund them. And let's be a little more quantitative about this I'm, when I say that we humans put so little effort to thinking about existential risk. This is... <laughs> $20 million is how much money the Union of Concerned Scientists has as their budget, okay? They're one of the largest organizations that are focused on at least some kinds of existential risks. They worry a lot about accidental nuclear war, for example. I don't know what your budget is exactly, but I suspect it's less than $20 million a year, right? Yeah. So let's shrink this down a little bit so that it becomes just a few pixels here on the screen, okay? Each pixel corresponds to a fixed number of, of pounds. Okay? And this is how much was spent on, pl on, cos on cosmetic surgery last year in the U.S. alone by area. Okay? Ten billion a year compared to, 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 to 20 million. And you know how much was spent on air conditioning for U.S. troops last year? 20 billion. Okay. And this is how much was spent on cigarettes last year in the U.S. Now, oh, fine, if people want to smoke, I'm all for people making their own decisions and stuff, but isn't it kind of pathetic that the f amount of money we spend on safeguarding the future of humanity is just such a puny fraction of the cigarette spending? And I haven't even mentioned this yet. U.S. military spending said between 700 billion and 1.2 billion, depending on whether you also count things like retirement benefits for generals and, and others, um, didn't even fit on the page. So I actually have to shrink it down. So now you almost need a microscope to see the X risk part here. This is, if we're putting our money where our mouth is, you know, this is how little effort we're, we're putting into safeguarding the future of, of humanity. And this is another reason why I'm just so excited that you guys here at the Future of Humanities Institute are, are, are doing what you're doing. <laughs> I, wish, I hope you can bring this up from 10 to the minus 6 to, a, you know, if you can get it to 10 to the minus 5, <laughs> it will be a step in the right direction, okay? Just to add, even, uh, add a little more urgency to this also, uh, try to persuade us, you, to make sure we don't blow it on this planet. Let's, let me talk about another cosmic question. Are we alone in our universe? The standard answer that people get, give me when I ask them, is almost always, no, no, we're certainly not alone. I mean, there must be a lot of life out there. Uh, I, I'm actually a contrarian here. I have a minority view. I think that we probably are alone in our universe. We probably are the only life, in, in, specifically in our universe, this region of space from which light has reached us in the last 13.8 billion years, that has gotten to advanced to the point of building telescopes. Why do I think so? Well, why do people think we're not alone? Usually people say, well, you know, there's just so many stars out there, there's got to be life somewhere. 
And yeah, there are a lot of stars. I mean, if you just keep zooming in here, there's just a lot of stuff, you know. I know that, okay, that's what I do for a living. Um, but most people don't really work the numbers when they make this argument. Someone who started working the numbers was Francis Drake when he wrote down the famous Drake equation and, and said that the number of, of advanced civilizations is the product of a whole number of, of terms here, which are all super uncertain, okay? Now, they're a little bit less uncertain than when he wrote this down. The first three numbers have to do with planets and stuff, and they're actually roughly known now. But then, there are two others here that we're totally clueless about. One is the fraction, oh, you can read for yourself here. But basically, the question of, the, the ones we know better now tell you about how many have, habitable planets there are, how many Earth-like planets there are out there in, in our universe. There's plenty of those to go around. But that's not what's going to stop there from being a lot of intelligent life. But what's the probability that a given planet like Earth actually evolves life that gets to the point of building telescopes or colonizing space or having conferences or whatever? We really don't know. Why not? Well, because there are several states we, we know we managed, right? But as and Nicky know there's no full well, the fact that it happened here doesn't mean it's likely. It just means it's possible. So there's some probability, P, for this to happen, which we don't know. It could be quite large, so that all planets automatically kind of get life. It could also be that it's ridiculously small. There are many places where it could be really hard. This is a ribosome I'm showing you. This is the machine that you all have in you, which produces your proteins by reading the, 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 the genetic code. It's a fantastic machine. It's pretty complicated. How do you make these machines? Well, it's built by other machines just like it. Right? So there's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing here. We don't know yet whether, the, whether you need a huge fluke to get the first ribosome or whether you can actually naturally evolve this in many, many small steps, none of which is unlikely. I know by, uh, si people on the biology side who I quite respect who have both of these opposing point of views. So I think the simple truth is we don't know. But what about intelligence? Dinosaurs walked around here on Earth for b hundreds of millions of years, okay, without building telescopes. It's not obvious that just because you get to the point of being able to stomp loudly that you're going to get more intelligent and form, uni form Oxford University and that kind of stuff because the dinosaurs didn't, okay? We had, sort of a, maybe a we had sort of a lucky break that they got taken out by an asteroid. So we little mammals that were just trying to avoid getting stepped on had a chance and then eventually we evolved. We don't know if that's something which happens very, very rarely or whether it's common. So what do we do when we don't know? We have a good method for this in science called Bayes' theorem. If, we, if there's some number we have no clue about what it is, we, we, we in geek speak like to give it what we call a uniform logarithmic prior. And what does that mean in plain English? It just means if there's some number that's very small, that we don't know anything about, we say, well, it's equally likely that there's 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 20, 10 to the minus 30, 10 to the minus 40. We just don't know, okay? If you do the math and ask, what would that imply for how far you have to go until you find the nearest planet with telescopes? Not too surprising, you get a uniform logarithmic prior for that too. Equally likely that it's 10 to the 10 meters, or 10 to the 20 meters, or 10 to the 30 meters, or 10 to the 40 meters, 10 to the 50 meters, okay? So let's look at a, 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 such a scale here where you have, it's a logarithmic scale, so we have, each time you go a factor 10, you go equally far to the left. It could be anywhere here, maybe out to 10 to the 100 or so, you go off the board. We also have some facts we can fold into this. We've looked nearby, haven't found anything in our solar system, as Enrico Fermi pointed out and has been further sharpened since. There are loads of planets in our galaxy that are perfectly comfortable to live on, very Earth-like, that are two billion years old, old, two billion years older than this one. Okay. So if life were pretty common, and then uh, I don't, I don't think there's any law of physics either preventing space travel. It's extremely hard to explain how, why you would have all these 
civilizations that have been here for two billion years and we haven't noticed anything and they haven't come, colonized Earth. So if you take, what I think that's telling us is that there is nothing here out to about 10 to the 21 meters. Well, but 10 to the 26 meters is already the edge of our universe. So if it's equally likely that you're anywhere out here to the, ne the nearest neighbor, and uh, they're not in here, it's not very likely that they're in this narrow strip of, of distances. That's my argument. Do I know that for sure? No. But I think it means we should be a little bit extra careful and not just take for granted that if we screw up, oh, don't worry because there's someone in, right there in the galaxy next door who's going to bail our universe out. Okay. I think we should take responsibility ourselves. And um, what can we do about this? Let me just conclude <laughs> with a little call to arms here. I, I think, I think uh, the first thing, if you feel strongly about, if you agree with me that we humans are not doing enough to think about our future, first thing you should do is go talk with those guys, the Future Humanity Institute, and see if you can support them in any way. I think they're, what you guys are doing is awesome, and you deserve all the help you can get. You certainly deserve more help than you've gotten so far. And um, also, just taking a step back a little bit, I think, as a physicist, if you ta task me with moving something which is much bigger than me myself, you know, what would I do? I would look for some kind of instability, where by exerting a rather small but cleverly applied force, right, I can make something tip over this way or that way and amplify things. That's how we humans generally accomplish big things, by exploiting instabilities. That's also how you get really rich by starting a company which exploits some sort of instability in the economy, right? Um, so it's very interesting to look if there are any instabilities in our society where you, as a single person or as a small group, can really make a difference for the better. I think one of the most obvious instabilities that we can use for better here is to do with information. So I just want to show, say a few words about this triangle here. Uh, are they going to kick us out exactly on the nose at uh, 1.30 or, do you know? So you told me to speak until, until, Okay, so if I take if five more minutes to finish, that's fine. Good. Um, what I'm showing here is I, the information we have falls crudely into three different categories. There's to be private information that you have and only you have in your head that you haven't told anybody, right? Then there's public information, if you disseminate it somehow. And today, public basically is synonymous with online. And then there is known information that's, in the, that's actually in the head of whoever is making the decision or that information matters. Okay? And we, we've had this very productive cycle of things flowing around this triangle in an iterative way for hundreds of years as science and the Renaissance and so on has swept Earth. And things can go wrong with all of these three arrows. The creation of knowledge, that's why Oxford University is here to help take information which is in the heads of researchers and in literature and create new information that's now in the head of the researchers, right? That's awesome. I'm all for it. And there are many reasons I've listed here for why it doesn't happen as much as it should. Then there are things which can foil the dissemination of the information. People might not have time to, po to write things online, or they might not be motivated, or they might be censorship, etc. <clears throat> for example, um, Mr. Snowden, you know, who leaked this American inf information about the NSA now, uh, he, uh, he published this stuff, but it, that's a huge personal cost for him. He's holed up in a hotel room in Hong Kong right now and has basically lost the life he had. Uh, finally, uh, the last one, taking public information and actually getting it into the heads of the people who vote or in the heads of the people who make decisions, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. And I actually feel that this third one is, in a way, the lowest hanging fruit of all. Because it's just absolutely astonishing how, how often very basic public information fails to get into the heads of the people who, could, who would make different decisions if they knew. For example, there were 12 people burned as witches in Haiti in 2010. Hello? You know, uh, 
in, in Afghanistan, there are 3% of the people who have internet, right? And 92% of the people in Afghanistan hadn't heard of the 9-11 attacks in a recent poll. You know? So like, no wonder, but it helps understand a little bit why people behave the way they do, right? And, and living in the US and, and watching presidential debates where, like in the Republican primary, where, where there are people who insist that our universe is less than, than 10,000 years old, uh, it really bothers me as a scientist. And if, you live, if, 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 there, if it were the case that there was just more public information that were actually in the heads of American voters, it would be political suicide for politicians to say such things, right? And um, so I, I, think, uh, so I think it's very interesting for all of us to think about what can we do to increase education? And I don't just mean increased teaching of the multiplication table, but I mean in education just in a very broad sense and actually getting information to people and focusing on the kinds of information that would really make a difference for the better. I think there's, there's just a lot of room for spreading rationality in the world. We scientists, I think, do a pretty good, we work very hard on creating information and then journalists try to help disseminate it in various ways. But here, I think, we, there's just a lot we can do. Okay? And if people have concrete ideas there, anything I can help with, I would love to know. OK, I've said a number of things here which might sound um, less than uplifting. So I want to end on an optimistic note, <laughs> this one. <laughs> this is a question where I'm actually really the more I studied cosmology after I met Joe, the more pessimistic I got, the more insignificant I felt. I knew my size, and as the universe kept getting bigger and bigger, I felt like I was more and more insignificant. But I've actually completely changed my mind on this now, and I wanted to share that with you. Why did I feel insignificant in the first place? Well, because I felt so small. But suppose I'm right in my guess that we are actually the only in life forms in our entire observable universe okay, who even have telescopes. Suppose it's actually only here on Earth that the, our universe gets its meaning. Suppose galaxies are beautiful only because of what happens here, because we see them. Okay? Then we're not so insignificant at all, actually. We have, we're small in that we have much fewer atoms in us than the sun does, right? but we're much more interesting. We are. <clears throat> and, and moreover, I also felt insignificant because I felt I was so small in time. You know, I felt even if I work out and eat my vitamins, you know, maybe I can live to 100. Well, my grandma made it to 102. But I'm, I'm not going to live for a billion years or 10 billion. So I'm just a spark in the, this eternity almost. And what difference is it going to make what I do on this planet? In, in this short time. But actually, I don't think that this time that we're living is, even if it's short, is insignificant either. Because I think there's nothing in the laws of physics that precludes life from ultimately developing to even more wonderful things and are spreading out into space and our whole universe coming alive. I think it's perfectly consistent with the laws of physics. It could happen. But will it happen? Well. If I'm right, then, then it's only on this we here on this planet who can accomplish it, right? And so this is so there's this that we're in the, at this fork in the road. We've gotten lucky and we've evolved up until this point, and now we have the choice. We can either cho choose the, the you know click one for death and wipe out one way or the other, or click two for life and get our act together. In which case, maybe one day in the distant future, our whole universe will be teeming with life. Where will that decision be made? Here on this planet. When will it be made? I think it will be made in our lifetime. I don't think we can just muddle along at this fork in the road for a very long time without just pretty much defaulting to just wiping out. I think we're in a very unstable situation. So <laughs> I don't know if in the future, if, if, if one day in the future our whole universe is teeming with life, Okay, I don't know how those distant descendants of ours are going to think of us. 
but they're certainly not going to think of us as insignificant. Okay? And the decision, what's going to make all the difference is what you do in your lifetime. Okay? So I want to end by imploring you to go out and make a difference. Thank you.